In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was. This is the Word of God. This is a Bible that I began preaching with um, many years back, and uh, it is quite worn. I still use it to this very day. I want to share something inside of the cover of this that I have. I'll show it to you. I have it taped on the inside. As a young preacher, I wanted to remind myself uh, each time I got up into the pulpit of these words. It's a prayer. Oh, God, don't let the pulpit call me to the sermon. Let the sermon call me to the pulpit. Before I break the bread of life, Lord, break me. Wash from heart and lip the iniquity there. I want to preach, yea, hemorrhage under the divine anointing. God, strip me of all pride, all cleverness, all showmanship and salesmanship. Deliver me from reliance on suaveness, education, academics and personality, notes, canned quips and celestial cliches. Let me speak with the humility of Moses, the patience of Job, the wisdom of Paul, the power of Peter and the authority of Christ. Lord, make my preaching clear, not clever, passionate, not pitiful, urgent, not usual, meaty, not murky. May it comfort the disturbed and disturb the comfortable. Warn the sinner, mature the saint, give hope to the discouraged, and ready for heaven the whole audience. Let self be abased, Christ be exalted, the cross be central, and the plea be with passion. May my eyes never be dry. And just now, Lord, take me out of myself. Usurp anything I've planned to say when it's in the way of your message. Here I am, Lord. I'm your vessel. Amen. So if you have your Bible, um, hold it up. Hold it up in the air. Hold it up in the air. This is the word of God. So open up your Bible to Hebrews chapter 4. And um, I want to I wanna begin with just examining why this is so important. By the way, this is very much connected to and linked with what we talked about on Wednesday night, this past uh, Wednesday. Uh, we began uh, looking at... Um, on Wednesday night, the question of uh, what does the Bible say about the reliability of the Bible? Is it true? And so we, we kind of unpack that a little bit, and uh, we're unpacking that even more today in terms of how it is that we got our Bibles. And next week, I will continue. And as you all know, we have had this whole foundation laid for us on several weeks from John Piper teaching a, a very Uh, scholarly way, mind you, about uh, why we can believe our Bibles. So, so many people today, just they don't understand God's word. And throughout history, it has been common for people to actually to stand up during the reading of God's word. And uh, I want us, uh, maybe just as we begin, it's kind of weird, but let's, let's do this together. Let's stand up and let's, let's read this first section of scripture, this first verse together as we stand uh, together and do this. From Hebrews chapter 4, beginning in the 12th verse, we read these words, For the word of God is living and active. Sharper than any double edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. That's the word of God. You may be seated. Scripture says that the truth in this book is alive. It's not just words on a page, but it is living. It is transforming. It is 
powerful. It is active in every single way. And yet, even though it is alive, so many people neglect God's word. For example, how many of you own one Bible? You have a Bible. That's good. How many of you own two or more Bibles? Interesting. How many of you, and be honest, this week did not read your Bible every single day? Well, what happened? Because we have God's word so readily accessible, so many of us neglect the Bible. Here's what, here's what scripture says. Psalm 119 verse 16. I delight in your decrees. I will not neglect your word. And that word neglect is a Hebrew word. And it, and the Hebrew word is shakak. Say that. Shakak. Shakak means to lay aside. It means to forget. So, I will delight in your decrees. I will not lay aside your word. I will not forget your word. I will not take your word for granted. I will not neglect your word. Why is it today that so many of us, even those of us that love God's word, we neglect God's word? It's because so many people don't understand what it really is and what it took for you to be able to hold that Bible in your hands. And today, we're going to look at the history of the Bible. So let's look at how God brought his word to us. It started thousands and thousands of years ago, somewhere between 1400 and 1500 BC, when God himself wrote the Ten Commandments, and, and uh, he did that on stone, and he ascribed the very first words in ancient form of Hebrew. God gave the Ten Commandments to Moses when he was up on top of Mount Sinai and God began speaking his words to us. Years later, the very first scriptures, they were known as the Pentateuch, came to being. Now they are the first five books of the Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. And for thousands and thousands of years, Scripture was recorded on animal skins. They were called scrolls. A scribe might use the skin of a, of a deer or a cow or a sheep, never a pig. A pig would have been unclean. That would have been totally inappropriate for God's word. But what's interesting is when the entire Pentateuch, sorry about that, I didn't fast forward, when the entire Pentateuch is found on a scroll, it is called the Torah. And a Torah scroll, if it would be completely unraveled, would be over 150 feet in distance. The scroll was so long that it would often take a whole herd of sheep to be able to write out the Torah. By approximately 500 BC, the 39 books that we know today as the Old Testament were completely, are completed and continued to be preserved on Hebrew scrolls. By the end of the first century AD, the New Testament was completed and it was preserved in the Greek language on papyrus which is a a thin paper-like material made from crushed and flattened stalks of a reed-like plant. In the year 367 AD, the bishop of Alexandria, a guy named Athanasius, wrote his Easter letter, and in it he listed all the books that you read today in the New Testament. 
Then in the year 393 AD, the African Senate of Hippo approved all of the books that you find listed in your New Testament today. By the year 500 AD, the Bible had been translated into over 500 different languages. People all over were so thankful because they could actually read God's word in their own language. But then something very unusual happened. In just the next century, the next 100 years, by the year 600 A.D., the Bible was only allowed in one language. Why was that? Well, the Catholic Church of Rome at that time was the only recognized church in the land, and they issued a decree that no Bible in any other language was allowed. If anyone found a Bible in any language beside, besides Latin, the person holding that Bible could be executed on the spot. You might be wondering, well, why did that happen? Well, unfortunately, the Catholic Church became very, very corrupt. The priests were the only ones that were educated in the Latin language so that the common person could never, ever read God's word. That gave priests ultimate power. They could teach the parts of the Bible that they wanted to teach, and they could even throw in some things that weren't in the Bible at all, and that was very common. In fact, it was common for a person to go and to pay for indulgences. In a sense, they were paying for forgiveness. If they sinned, they'd pay a certain amount of money, and the priest would say, well, because you've paid that, now you are forgiven. The Catholic Church also taught about a place called purgatory, and that is not a word that is found in the scriptures. But they said if your relative dies, they go to purgatory, a kind of holding place, a place that you really don't want to be. But for a certain amount of money, you can purchase the freedom for your relative from purgatory. In today's world, it would kind of be like this. If your grandma dies for $9,995, you can buy grandma a ticket out of purgatory. The priest used this forced ignorance And between the years 400 A.D. and 1400 A.D., they deceived the masses during a 1,000-year period, which became known as the Dark Ages. You may be wondering, well, how did the church break free from this long season of dark and horrible corruption? The answer is very simple. Once the Bible... The truth of God's word got into the hands of enough people and the right people. God used his truth through people to bring about the very necessary reformation of the church. So here's how that kind of happened. In the year 563 A.D., there was a guy named Columba. You may have seen his television show. Sorry, that was the wrong guy. Columba was a guy who actually started a secret Bible society, uh, a Bible school, where they would, they would and could faithfully teach God's word. And this, this group of people became known, uh, they became the remnant, I should say, where God's word was taught faithfully century after century. The students were known as the Colbys. It's a term that means certain stranger. They were strangers of this world. But for 700 years, the Colbys would disciple one another, and they faithfully studied God's word. In fact, it was out of this group that God raised up the right people to bring about the Reformation. In fact, in the late 1300s, one of these, a guy by the name of John Wycliffe, some pronounce his name John Wycliffe, uh, was a man that God used to do tremendous things. In fact, he was the very first man to translate the Bible into the English language. When he did so, all of a sudden, all these people who before could not read Scripture were now able to do so. All this time, some say, 
that it would take about 10 months to translate one single Bible. 10 months people would work to get the Bible translated into this language. Well, he was faithful in spreading God's word, but unfortunately he was also called a heretic And the Pope was so disgusted by this guy that 40 years after his death, the Pope ordered Wycliffe's bones to be dug up, destroyed, and then spread across the river. Some people say that Wycliffe was actually the morning star of the Reformation. He was the one that God used to start the ball rolling in the very necessary reformation of the church. Wycliffe also had a disciple or a, another student whose name was John Huss. And Huss was equally passionate about getting God's word into as many hands as, uh, of, of people as possible. Unfortunately, Huss too was called a heretic, heretic and he was actually burned at the stake. But get this, What do you think they used to start the fire around Huss as they burned him at the stake? They used his teacher, Wycliffe's Bibles. They spread Bibles all around him. And then they lit the Bibles on fire to burn Huss at the stake. But it was Huss's final words that became known as a prophecy that helped direct the very future of the church. At at the stake, before he was burned, the last words of John Huss were this. He said, In the next 100 years, God will raise up a man whose call for reform cannot be suppressed. And that's exactly what God did. In the year 1517, God raised up the man, Martin Luther, who was so fed up with all of the corruption in the church, he actually believed that God was calling him to help reform the church. In fact, it was on All Hallows' Eve that Martin Luther took what became known as as his 95 Theses. It was a document with 95 claims of heresy. And he took these 95 Theses and he went and he nailed it to the door of the church at Wittenberg. People now describe that event as the knock that was heard around the world. God used those accusations of heresy to spark what has become known as the Reformation of the Protestant Church. God also used Martin Luther to take the Bible and to translate it into the German language. He then took the recent invention called the printing press, the invention of Gutenberg, and he leveraged it to now get the Bible into the hands of even more of the masses. Of course, Luther was called a heretic. People did want to kill him, and he had to spend much of his life on the run, but God used him to spark major changes in the church and to get the word of God into the hands of the masses. About that same time, there was another guy, an Oxford Professor, His name was John Collet, or Collet, however you want to pronounce it. And he translated the Bible into the English language for his Oxford students. He also taught the Bible in the English language at St. Peter's, or St. Paul's Cathedral in London. For believe it or not, over 20,000 people would pack themselves into this cathedral simply to hear God's word in a language that they could actually understand. Not only were 20,000 people in the building, but it was said that as many people would be outside the building waiting to try to get in. Why? Because they were hungry. They were desperate. They would do anything simply to be able to hear God's word. What's sad is that beautiful historic cathedral exists today, went by it not too long ago myself. But instead of over 20,000 people every weekend, they minister to about 200. And most of these are simply tourists that actually pay money to get into the building. 
in the year 1526, there was a guy named William Tyndale who befriended Martin Luther. And God used William Tyndale to print the very first English Bible. The good news, that, or that was the good news, the bad news was anyone who was caught with this illegal Bible would be executed immediately. You could only imagine what demand there would be for people to read that uh, Bible in English, and they wanted to read God's Word in this language that they could understand. They would do almost anything to get God's Word into their hands. These people, they were incredibly creative, and they would often smuggle Bibles into England using all kinds of means to do so. Occasionally, they would put Bibles in bales of cotton to smuggle them in, or other times they'd put Bibles into bags of flour. Ironically, the biggest buyers of Tyndale's Bibles were actually the king's men. The king's men would buy as many Bibles as they could, not because they wanted to read them, but instead because they wanted to burn or destroy all of Tyndale's Bibles. Well, Tyndale, he was a good businessman, and he would simply take the profits of all of these Bibles that the king's men would buy, and he would use money to print even more Bibles to get the word of God out. Unfortunately, because of what he was doing and it being considered illegal, Tyndale was on the run for 11 years of his life. Imagine waking up every single moment in the morning knowing there are people that are actually hunting you down, wanting to kill you simply because you want to help other people experience the word of God. That's, that's what Tyndale experienced. Day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, he was on the run running for his life because people wanted to execute him. Sadly, they eventually caught up to him and incarcerated him for about 500 days before they finally decided in the year 1536 to burn him at the stake. His last words, though, were a prayer to God, which people remember still. He prayed, O oh Lord, open the eyes of the King of England. And three years later, in the year 1539, God answered that prayer. Not only did the king of England allow the printing of the Bible in the English language, but he actually helped fund it. Then later in the year 1611, a grossly immoral man who happened to be king of England at the time, King James I, was used by God to have the Bible translated into the common language of the day. This became very commonly known as the King James Bible. This translation was the final step in getting God's word into the hands of average people. Now think about this. Remember all the people who died, gave their lives fighting with everything in them to help God's living and active word be available to you. And sadly, so many of us today, shikak, neglect God's living word. We take it for granted. The Bible talks about Jesus who became flesh to know Jesus, to serve Jesus, to follow Jesus. We must feed on his word. And yet we neglect it. Imagine if you did not eat for seven straight days. What would you look like? Not one meal. For seven straight days, your body would be a mess. You might even need to be hospitalized. Your soul needs to eat. It feeds on God's word. Some of you, your, sh your souls should probably be in the ICU because of how you neglect the word of God. 
So many faithful men and women came before us and gave their lives so that we could have the word of God in our hands, but we can't even seem to carve out a little bit of time each day to actually read it. That's got to change. I want to pray with you this morning as we talk about this subject. Let's, let's pray together. Father, I thank you for, uh, for what the thousands and thousands of leaders throughout history have done in order for us to hold your living word in our hands. Help us, God, to commit to reading your word every single day. Help us to not neglect, forget, lay aside your word. Help us, God, to not take it for granted. Help us, God, with all of the many Bibles that each of us own, to have it be a tool that we utilize every single day, Lord. We need to get back into your word. You have done so much to make sure that your word is available to us, and we seem to work so hard at avoiding it. Forgive us. Call us back, God. Call us back to be a people of your word. Help us, Father. We pray this in the name of the word, Jesus. Amen.